Hey folks, Jeff Salzman here and welcome to The Daily Evolver. It is Friday, January 26th, 2018. And today I want to go a little bit far out and I want to take us all on a journey to a new land called Urantia, which is actually the name of our own home planet Earth, according to our guest today. And I'm eager to get a, in a good conversation with him. But this world, this Urantia, is a world that is alive with divine love and revelation and intelligence and a realization of the updraft to goodness, truth, and beauty. And the people in this land realize that they are evolving beings in an evolving cosmos, and that the cosmos itself is teeming with life, that there's all levels of celestial beings, angels of all sorts, and extraterrestrials from billions of inhabited worlds, just like ours. And that these beings love us and can communicate with us and guide us. And that Another big realization uh, in, in this land is that there is a deeply personal part of us, a soul that is evolving through lifetimes. And for some of us, it's our first rodeo, but uh, for most of us, we have a life that precedes this or, or an identity and one that survives this life. And, and I love this part. The purpose of our life is to grow. We're here to grow and to do our part in the greater process of perfecting the universe. And I love that expression. And, uh, you know, when I talk about the sacred world to come on this the webcast a lot, um, I, it's, it, I, it feels like it's, it would be something like this. And this is, you know, at least part of the essential vision of the Urantia book, which is a book a spiritual revelation that um, I've run into over the years. It, it arose in the early 20th century out of Chicago, and there's some sort of mysterious origins, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, I've had a couple encounters with it where I've read deeply in parts of it. I have a friend who's a very, very powerful sort of transmitter, and he's really into it. And, um, and I must say, I have been drawn to it. It has a clear evolutionary view, and um, it appeals to me. And, uh, you know, I get a little bit sort of lost with all the cosmology and all of the details, and it sort of throws me off, and my modernist kicks in. I don't rule this stuff out, but I can't rule it in either. And so that's where I've never really pursued a relationship with the Arantia teachings, and I don't really understand it deeply. But my guest today does. And so uh, I'd like to introduce him. It's Brian Belitzos and Bri By I'm sorry, Byron Belitzos. And Byron is the author of Your Evolving Soul, The Cosmic Spiritu Spirituality of the Urantia Revelation, which is just published in 2017. And Byron is an integralist. And he, in fact, was an inaugural member of Ken Wilber's Integral Institute back in the late 90s, uh, in the turn, turn of this century. And uh, he has advanced training in philosophy, theology, psychology, history. He's a practicing Christian. He has a lot of training in Zen and Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And a very cool guy, very smart. And he's into the Urantia book and the Urantia teachings. So um, I want to welcome Byron, Byron Belitzos, welcome. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's just such a thrill to be uh, with you, and I've enjoyed our discussions, and I'm sure I'm going to really enjoy this one. Yeah, me too. Uh, first of all, you know, it, 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 speaking of that, uh, Byron and I did a talk uh, oh, a few weeks ago that I'm also going to post. It's an audio, and uh, we get into probably more detail than we will here today, but, uh, but today... Uh, I, I, I guess since we're the integral ghetto here, let's just start with that, Byron. And, and you make the case that the Urantia teachings are the most integral spiritual revelation that um, exists. And so maybe just start there and make that case. 
Well, there's not too much competition for an integral revelation, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it really, you know, I, I, I was led to Wilbur because of the Arantia book. So I was looking for, wow, this thing is so incredibly interesting philosophically. Well, who else is saying anything like this? So I, I went through Hegel for a long time. I was a student of Hegel in graduate level. Student and uh, Whitehead, Aurobindo. Then I got to Wilbur. And uh, they were assigning um, Wilbur's first book when I was in graduate school in 1980. And then I thought, oh, this guy's, this guy's in this direction because I was reading the ranch book secretly. Because much of the time you have, you know, I've had to be secretive about it because it's so controversial. But um, well, I, I, let me just point out, we don't burn you at the stake anymore. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. it's still, you, you do pay a price. You do pay a price, and in graduate study, for example, I was, I was chastised, really. Don't do your dissertation on this thing. We don't know what it is, and we don't want to do it, you know. Right. Uh, but um, aside from that, uh, you know, the, 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 this is a very tolerant, you know, meme that we're part of. So you can, you can put this up, particularly out here in Northern California, everybody's into anything. And, but what, what happened to me was uh, I found Wilbur's uh, Sex, Ecology, Spirituality in the 90s and put up a website kind of comparing Urantia with, with Ken's work. Wow. Uh, particularly after this uh, sense of, what was it, The Marriage of Sense and Soul was really sounds like the Urantia book. It's like, it's like, did this guy copy this out of the, so, so I, I did this and Ken found my website. He found me through uh, Bert Parley. Uh-huh and contacted me and said, wow, this is interesting. Uh, thank you for you know, covering my work. Would you like to visit with me? So I visited with Ken. So that was way back 99 or something. Um, and um, ever since then, I've been working with the two bodies of writing together and they complement each other and supplement each other in beautiful ways. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And, um, and so let's go back to where your first take it up by this because you know this is a spiritual teaching this is a spiritual transmission and you know it landed with you right and you're meanwhile a graduate student in philosophy and uh and but you've got this heart beating here with urantia so how'd that happen it was kind of quirky i was actually in college in chicago at the university of chicago as a student of history of ideas and i'd gone through uh, a, a period of marxism and then from Marx to Hegel. And Hegel, I, was, I liked it. I don't know, most people thought it was pretty heady, but I thought it was a beautiful evolutionary philosophy, but also had a Christian theology at the heart of it, which is, which is uh, much different than traditional, but it's, it's deep and it's integral. And now, had you been raised Christian? I had been raised Greek Orthodox. Okay. So th th there are folks known for systematic theology and, and, and for a Trinitarian theology. So with Hegel, it was very similar and deep like that. And then suddenly I heard about the Rancho book because it was had a big vogue in the early 70s in a lot of circles, sort of hipster circles. And we found out like Jimi Hendrix was reading it and Bob Dylan knew about it. And Santana was, you know, giving it to his friends. And, and I found out later that the Haight-Ashbury was all over the place and people knew about it. And uh, so it was like a hipster kind of thing. So I thought, well, this is cool. I have to read this. And but it was, it was overwhelming, and, and I've, it happened I was in Chicago as a student, and it's based in Chicago, so I met mm -hmm. the core Urantia people there, and, and I thought they'd be, you know, with white robes and, like, sort of floating around the room, but they were just real down-to-earth, regular folks. Yeah, and, and some I'm, very cool folks. I mean, Mo Siegel here. In, uh, you know, founder of Celestial Seasonings is big into the Urantia book and the Jesusonian Institute and so forth. And so, so yeah, so you meet these people in Chicago. Yeah, then I get around, I met Mo back in those days and, uh, and like, wow, Mo's, you know. So I, I realized that this has got a lot of bright people involved who, who are older, you know, thinkers. And I, I, I plunged in and became a student, but with some trepidation because it makes claims big claims and need big evidence <laughs> right yeah so i've been looking for that evidence ever since uh, because i was taken emotionally and spiritually and mm -hmm. i found sort of the philosophic and scientific supporting evidence for the fact that this is a, a special what we call an epical revelation 
Mm -hmm. well, like, yeah. Before, okay, fair enough. And be, be, before we get into that, what is the revelation? How would you put it, particularly to those of us who have an integral spirituality where we, we already get that sort of updraft of evolution, and uh, we may not go for the whole nine yards of the Urantia revelation, but what could we learn from it? I'd say the, right, at the, right at the top, and just what you said at the top of the show, is that it's a love-saturated universe, meaning it's not just stars and galaxies. It's actually populated by deities who are loving deities and angels and, and other civilizations. And it actually says there are trillions of inhabited worlds that are, inha that are inhabited with humanoid beings. And the whole point of evolution is moving toward love and toward perfection. So through love, one gets to perfection. So this is, a, this is really like a Christian sounding teaching, mm -hmm. not as love, as a loving personality, divine personality. And so the core teaching may be, you're placed here to grow a soul and grow into the afterlife, into an eternal life, which it sounds like the gospel in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And we're here, we, the, the higher beings, are here to support your growth into uh, eternity. I mean, that makes you feel pretty good mm -hmm. <laughs> that you, you have an eternal life and that it's all about love and friendship. Yeah. And service. Right. And, and personal growth. And there's support systems for that. Yeah. So why is it so ugly? The Arantia book uh, is important in, for those looking at the nature of evil extremely important and not well understood what it says about that. But the, it gives you uh, a, a prehistory showing that in our uh, early, early history, pre-Sumerian history, there something went very wrong in our, on our planet, a very rare happenstance. I don't know if you know this part, Jeff, that that's called the Lucifer Rebellion. So on a normal planet, the angelic host of the planet, so each, each planet is populated, grows from single cells uh, to uh, human, humanoid beings. But there's also, it's populated with angels who they're hosting you, so to speak. So the angelic host of the planet went to the dark side. It start, sounds like Star Wars or something, but they went dark. And this happens very, very rarely. There was a rebellion and it was spoken about in Milton's Paradise Lost and things like that. So the, the, this, this satanic kind of rebellion led by Lucifer. So it sounds like myth, but it, it, it spells this out in such a way that it is, sounds like authentic history to me. And the evidence for that we see in front of us because it's not typical for a planet to have, to have atrocities, you know, to have genocide, to have holocausts, to have nuclear warfare, that is, totally atypical for an inhabited planet, but in one in a million planets will have this, this, this default, they call it, in which the, the angels hosting the planet go dark, although some of the angels did not. So there was a split and a kind of war in heaven, so to speak. So this, in this war in heaven, the balance was tipped only when Christ came to the planet. And that was really the termination of the Lucifer Rebellion. See, all of this seems so mythic to me. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, it's just these stories of the rebellion. And, and um, I, I, first of all, let, let me just uh, ascertain, you don't have to believe all this to still get the juice, do you? I mean, no, I'd say this is... I mean I, I, here's what I want. As, as an integral practitioner, I, I want to open up to the personal aspect of the universe. You know, so my, you know, I grew up with a Christian thing. I have the Buddhist thing where we sort of deconstruct all that and we go into emptiness. And I like the idea that the, that the uh, ultimate nature of reality has a deeply, drippingly meaningful personal aspect. And that there's a Jeffness that uh, survives this life and that, that I am here to grow and I'm an evolving man, all that stuff. And that, and even I'm good with beings that are communicating with me. I'm just sort of like opening to that. I certainly, why would I rule that out? Why would we rule out that there are billions of, of inhabited worlds? I mean, that would be silly. 
So I'm good with that. So can I work with that without believing in the Lucifer rebellion? Yeah, of course, you know, you can pick and choose anything. <laughs> it hangs together. Well, in Christianity, you kind of can't. You got to go for the whole thing or, you know, you get uh, burned in hell. So, well, yeah, that, that, that's a really pretty. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. A liberal Christian. You know, well, your ranch is beyond that. You know, certainly beyond any yeah. modern. It's right. post postmodern. Yeah. Of things and well, and I actually just for another little insert here, I do find it kind of uh, you know, even though I have a sort of uh, modern uh, antibodies to it, the idea that we're uh, that the universe that we're that we made a mistake that there is there's something aberrant about Earth that we went through this, and actually everybody doesn't have to because it is mighty ugly. I mean, and, and you know. It's a very uh, now, I have other ex explanations for how that works that actually are sort of Christian in, in the sense that once we realize this world is not our home and suffering is meant to wake us up and there, you know, we can find meaning in suffering that way. And that even the little girl who's raped can at some point learn to, in uh, some uh, afterlife. I heard this from this archbishop and I thought it was kind of sweet in that she can learn to forgive her attacker, that she can grow that big. And that's the point of all of that. So there's that explanation for suffering without it being a sort of a mythic rebellion and all that. that I don't know. Yeah, let's just, just stick with that because really, Fair enough. you know, there's adversity uh, in evolution. I don't care what planet you're there from. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you have to struggle to learn to speak, to walk, to, you know, to think, yes. to, to right. love, live and love. Right. So it's in the adversity that the soul is made, right? Yeah. That's really the point. And so what, what do we mean by soul making? And it's especially poignant on, on our planet, so-called Urantia, because we've had so much adversity on the planet, planet-wide. So that what's really great about our planet is that, and a great privilege to be here, is that in the face of adversity, you have all these tools that you're endowed with. And so the nature of the self is such that it can handle anything if you deploy those spiritual uh, uh, assets that you have that, that are just given. And you don't know that you have them. So you need to be told. So you need a religion to tell you, you know, that you need, you know, Hinduism to say there's this Atman and this is from Brahman, Brahman and, and it's got everything in it and it's, in, in, you know, infinity. So that, that resource, the ranch book is telling you that, but in a post postmodern context, so it's the same teaching, but it's nice to have it in, in a way, a, a, a teaching that has a, a philosophic integral view that you don't right. have to pose on it, which we do, like with Ken Wilber's fourth turning of Buddhism. Right. Rewriting Buddhism, you know, and it's beautiful. It's great. Right. And kind of rewriting that integral Christianity now. We got a lot of writing, but it's already built in in the Arantia book. It's already an integral Christianity. Right. So, but it's much more built in, built out. Its architecture is much bigger than integral Christianity as, 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 as inspired by Ken. All right. So, uh, yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, I, um, I, I want to know about how, that's, how it's built out. I also want to know about your particular experience um, and, and particularly with, uh, you know, uh, cosmic beings uh and is there any you know the thing you want to share about that uh, you know and how does that help us you know integral uh promiscuous spiritual practitioners who well, you know I, I always love ram das he says take the teachings and run uh so you know i want to know what what's your experience how do we develop that you know what's going on well, the first part of your question about, you know, what, so we're fill in, filling in this big architecture yeah. to, well, who are these beings that are out there, right? So yes, thank now you. Now we have, you know, people bombarding us with these channel things and from these beings or these extraterrestrials, like, where are they from? You know, you hear these plant names of these planets, it, it just, it's just so inchoate, you know, really, truly. And as a publisher for 22 years, I've been pitched all these crazy things channeled by, but the Rancher book says, well, you know, let, you can't know this because you're a, a mortal living on a planet, but we're out here and we're gonna tell you what's out here and there's no way you can notice unless it's revealed to you. So here's the architecture right. of the bigger uh, cosmos, which is, you know, making you more cosmocentric. But if you had off-planet beings telling you this, 
And if you believed it, then you would have a bigger. So this is telling you there are billions, actually trillions of inhabited planets, that, that they're galaxy clusters that are fully inhabited and other galaxy clusters that are not inhabited. And there's, so there's a central core of galaxies that are inhabited, but, but it's very small portion. The rest are uninhabited, will be inhabited. And, and it's got a governance to it. The universe has governance. And the governance is, is handled by administrative type angels. But there's also a ministering angels aspect. So there are angels that minister directly to humans lovingly, but there's other beings that are holding a space for the whole universe, including the ascension, what we call the ascension. Aww. What happens in the afterlife? So right now we have this like really flat earth view of the afterlife. It's like, okay, you go up there and you, I don't know, you then you reincarnate quickly or something. And, and maybe you get from Hinduism, there's one part of Hinduism, really the higher Christians to say there's higher worlds you go to, but it's very mythic sounding. But this is, this is a description of these worlds as ordinary places. You get a little bit of that in Steiner too, and, and here and there, but, but it's, in Steiner, it's kind of really offbeat and weird. The Rancho book is very straightforward. There are these higher planets, and here's what you're gonna do there. This is what and you're there, and, and clearly there's some you know, means of transport communication or all oneness or just, you know, the, uh, the, these are in different dimensions or, or, or you know, what? They're just gradations, you might say. Of So in the, after, the immediate afterlife, you have a body that looks like you, but it's a higher, more refined energetically, the body itself. And it's still you with your unique personhood. And you're always going to be your unique self, but you're going to grow into living from that selfhood slowly as your soul evolves. The soul slowly evolves to perfection. And when it does, it fuses with the self, with the, the inherent intrinsic unique self and the spirit endowment of the self. So the three, so backing up a little bit, the three endowments of the self and the sort of the, the design of the self is, uh, and we're not talking about the body mind, that's, that's just the, what's growing as, as sort of from animal origin body. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the metaphysical parts of the self are the, the evolving soul, which is the part, the only part that we personally have control over and that we co-create in partnership with the endowment of the Buddha nature, if you want, uh, the, the, the Atman, the spirit self, which is not the person, not the personhood. It's impersonal, but it's a highly, highly, highly refined fragment. It's a fragment of deity. Is that an individual fragment that, that stays Jeff um, or, or is Jeff or is it impersonal in the sense that it's um, same one for everybody? One for everybody, but it's modular. Okay. <laughs> so the, the, you're, you're given this provisional uh, spirit self that's not mm -hmm. your identity. Mm -hmm. Okay. In addition, you're given the unique personhood mm -hmm which is distinct. So my book is written to show, here's what uh, Aristotle said about that. Here's what Plato said about that. Here's what Hegel said about, it. here's what Descartes said about these, these ideas. Mm -hmm. No one really quite got it, except a few like Steiner really kind of has the same architecture. Mm -hmm. and, and Hegel sort of does and Whitehead sort of, but, but, but this is much more precise architecture. So again, let me make this distinction clear. That the, the Mark Gaffney style unique self is very close to what the Arantia book, and I've communicated with Mark about this, he knows this, is very close to this notion of a God given identity which has very peculiar characteristics that are you, and that in all future time, you'll be, you, your signature is no, knowable because mm -hmm. it's very unique to you. Mm -hmm. and there's something about personhood. That, that even you see somebody 50 years later, you're like, oh yeah, I remember you, you know? Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. And, and that's different from the Buddha nature, from the, from mm -hmm. the impersonal. So yes. these, all these parts of the self, so the first, the higher two are existential, they're non-evolutional. And the part that's evolving is the soul, which is evolving as the mind, the material mind evolves 
and makes better decisions. So the soul captures your best experience, not so much best, but most poignant experiences. Hmm. Uh, so it can be bad experiences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just what's important for making your character what it is today. There's something taking a snapshot of each of these events, and they're all throughout the day. Those are stored in and as the soul, so that is evolutional. Mm -hmm. So the, the spirit self is not evolving and is modular, it's on loan to you. And if you choose, you can fuse with it. So this is what we might call enlightenment, but it's really post-enlightenment. So enlightenment is you're dwelling in this inner, inner light, and that's recognizable. But here we're talking about fusing with it. If you were to fuse with it, mm -hmm. you would you would combust. You would have a rainbow body phenomenon. You would you would leave the body, and so in advanced planets, you know, like everybody's running around like they're Aurobindo or something. They're they're so advanced that they they don't die. They fuse, and they go up in light, and they disappear. And that, that's, that's what happens at cemeteries. <laughs> they actually mm -hmm. have these arenas where, okay, I'm ready, you know, I'm 400 years old now and I'm ready to fuse. But most for us, less advanced, our fusion happens in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. So you're going to become a Buddha and, unless you choose to not go, not go on. Then you have that option. And what happens then? You, you, you ask to be snuffed out, so to speak. You know, it sounds harsh. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to Buddha. But you're going to go to Buddha. But if, yep. but if you were Hitler, you know, according to the Rancher book, oh. you would survive. After death, you would wake up in a resurrection chamber, and, the, and these angels would be present. They would say, look, you've, you've survived death, you know, so you're here with us, and you're Hitler, and this is your life. And so they've reconstructed the self with a new body. A higher, more refined, and then they say, you know, this is what's in your soul, Mr. Adolf Hitler. You know, death of millions of people. You know, and this is in your soul, and you need to kind of work through that and heal that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do that? Because we have a really great curriculum for you, and and they do a life review. And I have first chapter of my book, Your Evolving Soul. I talk about life review uh, and near death experience, which is exactly what the ranch police say. They're going to show you your whole life because it's stored up in you and your hard drive of your soul. Mm -hmm. And you're Adolf Hitler. You say, you know, I don't really want to fix that. It's beyond hope. And they say, no, no, no. We love, universe loves you. You know, we, we forgive you. you. You're forgiven. He said, I can't accept it. I couldn't accept this forgiveness. And so you, they say, you have an option to, to opt out. Wow. So All the right. soul that he developed, so the soul is conserved. But the personhood that was attached to it is removed, like uh -huh. surgically removed, and the soul continues on. And it becomes a possession of deity. So there's a record of everything, even the most dark things. And that, that's, that's an evolutional view of, of the cosmos, that everything yeah. that happens is recorded and no, is... No, it, it makes perfect sense in, in its own way, you know, in terms of how we would expect this thing to, you know, evolve because evolution means not just better of the same. It's a whole new thing. The next stage of evolution is not really predictable from the current one. So I'm good with that. Uh, to, to sort of just bring it down to a, 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 you know, how we could light up our life with this. Uh, so you, you're talking about everything we do has meaning, right? And, and it, it go, it's sort of gets recorded. And our job here is to perfect the universe through perfecting our own souls. So that's sort of our daily guidance, right? I mean, that's, that's our orienting spiritual guidance, right? Yes. And, 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 and then, so I love that. That's good. And then uh, we get help from these other beings. So do you get help from other beings? Yeah, I mean, you know, in the sense that most of it's unconscious, right? So, uh, but in, in a more advanced uh, situation, you may have the ability to contact these other beings. But it's really, I think, secondary to the fact that it's a friendly universe. Ah, uh, thank you. It's friendly. And, and so it's friendly to evolution. 
so it's friendly to your evolution and and whatever tools that is are available that you would listen to they will approach you and this is gets me into something if i may into why where there's a difference with integral theory cool in, or integral theology if you will so because for the most part you know we grew up in integral theory with a, a more of a monistic uh, unitary view of spirit and i think that ken gets this from plotinus <laughs> you know he gets it from uh from uh, Buddhism as well, and Vedanta. So uh, non-duality, you know, is, is at the core here. But here it's a little different because we think of deity in the Arantia book more like a Christian deity and, and that there's a relational deity. Relational deity being that it's not just the one God or the one spirit or the one monad or whatever you want to call it, but it's in relationship to co-equal beings. And, and if it weren't, then it wouldn't really be, in my view, a loving rela relational God. Because if God doesn't have equal partners, it's really not a communitarian view of deity. It's, it's a deity that's above all of us, or sort of like Allah in, 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 in Islam. It's just there's the merciful Allah and then everybody else. And, and, it's, and, he, and it's in a kind of authoritarian relationship. But in the Rancher book, the, the deities are in a community of three and seven, and but there's the one, always one, but always differentiable, uh, differentiable into the Trinitarian notion of the Son and the Spirit, and but all of them are equal. So it's the paradox of one and many fused in the yeah. theology. Yeah. So we get that, and the reason I bring that up is it, because of our personal growth is related because the, the mission of angels does not, end, uh, does not emanate from God the Father, from the primal Father. There's actually not a, not a gender attached to this, but it, it, it emanates from the spirit that is the third person, because the third person is, more, is, is the ultimately relational deity. So it sends out, it actually propagates angels, hmm. and that's its ministry. And that's all, that's what it really does. But the second person of divinity, its job or his job, her job is incarnations. Why? Because the primal father doesn't know what it's like to incarnate. The son does, the son is differentiates from the father and knows what it's like to be a, uh, to have a parent. So the father is basically outside of time and space. This is a, um, you know, uh, I, I think of Tibetan Buddhism has this idea of just the, the they talk, talk about it being a cervix of just where everything's blowing out of, everything's coming out of it. Uh, and uh, it, so, but it's outside of time and space, right? It's uh, utterly outside of time and space. But still has a personal quality. It has a personal quality in the sense that it couldn't be any less than personal. Well, thank you. Yes, because it's much more than personal. Because personal is not reducible to impersonal. Yes, is it, they're like side by side with one another. Yeah, uh, yeah, fair enough. Steve McIntosh talks about them being, you know, sort of an ultimate reality, being a polarity between the personal and impersonal. And, you know, that out of that polarity arises the whole shebang. Exactly, and I think that's exactly right. And, and, and there are actually other elements of the Durantia book, but those are two of the core of it, the impersonal. is really a lot of the religions have focused on the impersonal. And Buddhism, and maybe in particular, you know, original Buddhism at least. Well, and a lot of uh, integralists, a lot of green, uh, you know, we still have antibodies to our personal mythical, you know, religions that we grew up with. And so we go to Buddhism and we sort of uh, wring some of that out of the system and, you know, develop this impersonal view. Uh, but we don't want to let that get reified either, because uh, it, for, it, for me, bringing back the personal. Oh my God! There you go. You'll pardon the expression. Yeah, it changes everything. Well, I think you really light up from that, and and I think that that's evidence that yeah. we yeah. want to, you know, and we are persons in a personal universe. Yeah, with love as at the heart of it. Yeah, you light up. And you think, oh, well, you mean the universe is friendly? It is loving, and that and that meaning it's not just an abstraction, but they're loving beings. 
So at the heart of this is, is outside of space and time, as you were saying, this is out, yes, it's outside of space and time, it's non-evolutional, deity, all love, but it's personal, but they're beyond personal as well. Right. But if this is the creator, and that's the proposition, the creator can't be less than creature. So the creator would have to be, have eyes to hear and ear, you know, it says in the Bible, it has to be able to be able to relate to its creature. So that would mean it would be personal in that, in that respect. But it's, it's infinitely transcends the personal. And this is also, it's not a huge revelation. It's in Christian theology as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but Christian theology doesn't have this notion. So, for example, that the second person of the Trinity sponsors incarnations, avatars. That's, that's its ministry. So they're trying to reach you through angels. And if that don't work, they'll send an avatar. That's sent from the second person. And the avatar is, is Krishna, for example. That's a mythic version. Mm -hmm. But Christ, according to your ranch book, was not a myth. It was sent from, from the central domains outside of space-time to represent the divine personal love of, of, the, of, of God in that fashion. Well, we killed him. <laughs> so, but we have other, they have other ways to do it, right? So, so the father, the primal first source and center they call the father, sends a tool also. And that's the indwelling spirit, which is, which is a gift from God. <laughs> you know, where does the Buddha nature come from? We don't know. And it sends two endowments, the personality, unique self, and this personal, not personal, but impersonal divine spirit. It, so that's a lot of gifting. Mm -hmm. And so you got it from within, you got it from without, you have angels coming in and then you, mm -hmm. have, and you have an avatar that incarnates. Mm -hmm. Particularly the avatar would come at a very pregnant time when people are looking. So in, in the time of, Christ, there was, there was a, a search for a Messiah, not just among the Jews either. It was like the whole Mediterranean was alive with what's, what is going to be revealed. There was, there was the Gnostic uh, current was huge. So, and this is a time as well, we think, uh, that there will be another avatar, but that's a whole other subject. But in any case, th this is, this is the, the personal growth aspect of this is divided yeah. into three domains. Um, and not and, and so it helps you to articulate. Okay. Oh, you know, this is the ministry. This is how I'm being loved by God, but God's mother mother side through angels. And oh, this is how I'm being loved by God as as who as son as derivative through an avatar. Oh, and this is how I'm being loved by the primal father from within, a miraculous endowment. And so, how is that compatible with integral theory? My book will tell you. <laughs> but well, don't. yeah. Well, it's uh, it's kind of first, second, and third person, right? It is. It is. Yeah. It, it truly is. But it's yeah. but it's somewhat. You know, that's kind of a, a tip of the hat to a trinity. Yeah. That Ken makes, but it, it lacks in, in philosophic depth. I hate to say, uh, compared to the the trinity in the ranch book or in Christian. In academic Christian theology is much more depth, but still, it, 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 it in terms of the uh, you know how it actually helps us to develop a spiritual practice, the idea that there's this indwelling spirit, I mean that is a dimension of my spiritual practice that I don't want to miss. That there is a, um, a somebody who sees me and loves me and knows my Jeffness and cares about me and is willing to you know relate to me. Uh, I don't know who that is, but I'm working on sort of relating to him, her, or it anyway. And then also just the manifest reality of this universe. Oh, my God, as a third person. Uh, those are, you know, you could do worse than keep those balls in the air. Those are really great. They're important to have the, the, the one, two, three view. Also, of course, Ken exalts the truth, beauty, goodness triad. And the Rancher book mentions it in like 85 times. And, and so the growth of the soul is really indexed, you might say, to your, your true beauty, truth, beauty, and goodness experiences. So if you cultivate those, you're growing the soul. If you do it consciously, you're really yeah. growing the soul. And, and um, 
you know, I, I pointed this out to Ken about the truth, beauty, goodness part of the ranch book. And I, I gave him a copy. This was back in 1999. He was flipping through it really fast. And it was amazing to watch him take in a book. When you see him up close, it's, it's something to see. I know. It is. It's amazing. Like eating it. Yeah. So he was going through it and he said, well, you know, I read this when I was 17, the Rancho book. You know, he read everything when he was of 17. Of course he did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the last time I saw him, he was much more inquisitive about it. Uh-huh. And this was just last year, right? Yeah, last uh, July when I went to yeah. see well, you were doing, you were out with your book, right? I was out touring with my book. I was in yeah. Denver. Yeah. So Ken said, come see me and yeah. do the book and talk to me about it. It's yeah. Something. Well, it's, it's really great to have you in the integral fold because you bring this piece of the puzzle. And, you know, I have such, you know, antibodies to anything that feels mythic. Uh, not, you know, not that I don't want to see it as beautiful in an art form and there's all kinds of, you know, ways of looking at it that way. But to have a guy who's really smart, who's been around the block and knows what he's talking about, and you're all in on this, you know, even that alone. It sort of expands my bubble a little bit because I think, how, how could he do that? But there you are. So anyway, Byron Belitzos, thank you so much for being with us today. And if people are interested in more, your, your book, again, is Your Evolving Soul. Yeah, you asked me to flash it on the screen. Yes, please. Yeah, there it is. A Cosmic Spirituality of the Urantia Revelation, Byron Belitzos. And, um, and you have a website. The site is evolving-souls.org. So Great. Sign up because I have a lot of things going out soon. I have Sean es Esvajorn uh, Hargens I'm interviewing about all of this. And I just interviewed Dustin DePerna about it. And I think that Ken Wilbur is going to come on my little show too. And so, you know, because he, he's, he can't say no. <laughs> but, yeah. um, so uh, I'd love to have integralists commenting on my work. And, and, and especially there's a couple of chapters that talk about Wilbur's work, integral theory, and I'd love to see what people say about it. So right on. to meet me through my website and my book. And again, the website is evolving hyphen souls, plural, plural. Dot, 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 dot. dot org. Okay. And, uh, you know, and come back and visit us again. There's so right. much to talk about. Love to do it, Jeff. Thank All you. Right. All right. All right. All Thanks, best. Byron. God bless you. Bye-bye now. Bye, folks. I thought that went great. It really did. I mean, that was the conversation we wanted to have right yeah, there. Yeah, I'm so glad we redid it. You know. Yeah, me too. Rehearsal, but this was much more fun. Me too. All right, so I'll post this with the audio. I think I asked Corey. I haven't gotten back if if he's going to post it on Integral Life, but I'll for sure post it on my side of the street on a Daily Evolver. And um, yeah. Okay. So, goodbye right. for now, Byron. Okay, we'll be talking. Okay. Right. God bless you. Bye. -bye.